Morning, friends. Today's reading is from Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 22. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. They, this went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honour. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practised sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread wild, widely and grew in power. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. There we go. I think I'm on now. Well, I don't know how about your feeling, but I'm feeling very encouraged, you know, just hearing the work God is doing in India and through you, but also that story we just read out. Wasn't it a really wonderful one. And I wonder as we just heard it read out, I wonder what stood out to you. I wonder what caught your ear, ear in particular. Because that chapter we just read out in Acts 19 is action-packed, isn't it? It's kind of like this action movie, you know, Indiana Jones or The Avengers or Star Wars, where this big fight scene on Earth goes into a fight scene in space, and then this epic battle on another planet. All this stuff happens, and then it just stops, and you just catch your breath. That's kind of like what's just happening here. We're just like, whoa, what just happened here? Because we see something very similar here in Acts chapter 19. We see story after story of the gospel, the good news of Jesus just going everywhere. We see people come into faith, the Holy Spirit, tongues and prophecy. People hear the gospel. Demons are cast out. Sicknesses are cured. Demons beat up people. People burn their magic scrolls. There's so much here. And I wonder... What stood out to you especially? And as we read this story, with all its wow moments, I think what Luke, the author of this story, really wants to draw our attention to is something we might have actually missed at the very end. In Acts chapter 19, verse 20, it says that in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. 
You see, the Word of God is actually central to this whole thing. The Word of God is actually what changes people. It spreads, it grows in power. In the original language, it's even stronger. It says it prevails, it succeeds. You see, beyond what might have actually stood out to you as we were reading that, demons, speaking in tongues, all these kind of things, what Luke, throughout Acts and in this book, and in this passage, really wants to draw our attention to is the Bible. That Bible you're holding in your hands right now, or we're just seeing up on the screen, it's powerful. Luke wants us to know that God's Word is powerful. And the message of my talk today is that God's Gospel is unstoppable. God's gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is unstoppable. Nothing will stop it from advancing. And I think as we look forward to this mission week, or we think about our own lives, I think we need this reminder. I think we need this reminder because this truth gives us confidence. You know, as you look around the world in your neighborhood, the direction our culture is heading in, maybe your family or friends, people rejecting the faith... I wonder if we can have low confidence in the gospel. As I said before, I live in Parramatta, and whilst I'm so thankful God has brought the nations here, I often feel so overwhelmed by the number of people to reach, how hard it is to connect and show them that Jesus is the only way. I wonder if you ever feel like that the Bible is weak sometimes, that this 2,000-year-old book just isn't powerful enough to reach the people in your neighborhood. And I guess my hope today is that Acts chapter 19 would give us a fresh confidence that God's gospel is unstoppable. So how about I pray for us just now? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have spoken. Thank you that you are not a silent God, but you are a speaking God. And we thank you that when you speak, you transform lives. So we pray, give us soft and humble hearts to listen to these words. And we pray that your spirit would give us confidence in the power of your good news to save many in our world. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God's gospel is unstoppable. And as we focus on Acts chapter 19, that huge chapter, I want to retrace four of the scenes that were in there. And in each scene, we see four different people, four different responses, and there are also four different lessons for us. But central to it all is the word, God's powerful gospel. So you can see on the slides, in scene one, we see Paul interact with followers of John the Baptist. In the second one, he debates with Jews in the synagogue. In the third one, he's speaking in a lecture hall every day for two years. And the fourth one, we see him engage with evil spirits, those who are sick. So let's rewind. Think that, you know, the VCR, rewind. Rewind back to the first scene. Uh, We're going to see Paul arriving in Ephesus. I don't know if you know much about Ephesus, but it was a big city within Asia. It was like a city by the water. Think like a seaport for ships and trade, almost like Botany Bay, a gateway to the rest of Asia. But it was also a place where not many people knew about Jesus. So when Paul arrives, he meets some disciples. That's the word we use to think about someone who might be a follower of Jesus. But we're not yet told who they believe in. So we see, read with me in verse 2, he asks them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? I don't know about you, but it sounds like a strange first question to ask someone. Have you ever gone to a party and seen someone who's a Christian say, did you receive the Holy Spirit? You know, you might say like, well, what church do you go to? Tungabi Anglican Church. How did you get saved, right? You might start something like that. But Paul says, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Now, this might sound like a strange question, but he asks this because The Christians, the early Christians, didn't just receive information. They didn't receive a message about a man, but they received and trusted in something of God. God's Holy Spirit gave them new life when they received His powerful message of salvation. And when any believer trusts in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and calls Him Lord, Jesus gives them this Holy Spirit, enabling them to please God. But we see that they answered... No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. You see, these guys are 20 years or so behind the times. They were baptized by a guy called John the Baptist, but they haven't heard yet about Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So Paul explains in verse 4 that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. Paul is pretty much saying, if you follow John, you would know he told you to follow Jesus. He's the one. 
John baptized you to repent of your sins, and Jesus came to wash you of your sins once and for all. That is all you need to know. That is what you need to know. And we see that after this in verse 5, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. You see, they hear about Jesus, they believe in Jesus, they were baptized in Jesus. After learning about Jesus, they receive him, they move from death to life. How good is that? Now, at the same time, they also receive the Holy Spirit, gifts of speaking in tongues and prophesying. Now, it's worth acknowledging for a minute that it sounds like what he's saying is that becoming a Christian and receiving the Holy Spirit means you also get these miraculous gifts. But it's worth just clarifying a few things, and this may not cover everything on this topic. might be a good one to chat after the service. Um, But speaking in tongues here is about miraculously speaking another human language for private worship or so other people can hear the gospel in their native tongue. And we see that clearest in Acts chapter 2, right? And prophecy is about God revealing a message in line with His Word that encourages, convicts, and strengthens the church. But zooming out, above all, we see that throughout the whole Bible, God's Holy Spirit enables signs and wonders in certain periods of times. You know, think about the time of Moses, Elijah, the prophets, Jesus, and the early church. But their purpose is always to testify to God's message in those particular times. And God had promised now that in these last days, He would pour out His Spirit on believers. So as these new believers are receiving the Spirit of God and these gifts, these specific gifts, these are also signs of a new era, like the baton has been passed permanently from John the Baptist to Jesus. But most importantly, Paul is not teaching that you need to receive these gifts to be saved. You know, some people falsely teach that you're not a true Christian unless you can speak in tongues or something like that. Maybe you've heard a form of this before. But what we see in this story is that these men believe in Jesus. They place their trust in Jesus and they move from death to life. And I think what Luke is trying to show us here is just that, just how powerful the gospel is. You see, even though our hearts are naturally inclined towards sin and we've all rejected God, these men were open to hearing the message. They just needed it explained to them. You know, often we're fed the narrative that Christianity is in decline. But many people aren't necessarily against Christianity. They just just don't understand it. You know, it reminds me of my wife, Kartika, who's here today, and how she came to faith. Uh, Even though by nature she was hostile towards God in her heart, God still gave her an openness to understand who Jesus was, what the Bible was all about. In the end, all it took was someone inviting her along to a Simply Christianity course where she heard Jesus explain clearly from the Scriptures. And that helped her to know she could trust Jesus with her whole life. In this first thing, we see disciples of John, people who already believe in God, but they just need to hear the message. So the call to action, the lesson for us here is to explain the gospel to these people, and some will believe. There are people who are open to receiving the good news, but they just have questions. And maybe this is even you. Maybe you still have big questions in life. Why not spend some time to ask someone after the service one of those questions? Why not um, come along to the next life course that Mike will be running through, going through? But for the rest of us, I wonder if there's maybe someone you could help. I wonder if there's someone in your life who might be interested in the message, but you just haven't explained it to them yet. Maybe all it takes is just you meeting up with them over coffee or tea to read the Bible for some time. And I want to encourage you that you can do this because this is powerful. The Word is powerful. At my um, old church in Western Sydney, we started the year often with a seven-word challenge, uh, a challenge to ask a friend or a family member. Here it is. It's, will you read the Bible with me? Seven words. Will you read the Bible with me? And I'd love to encourage you to take up that challenge, to contact someone in your life who doesn't yet know Jesus. Who can you say those seven words to? Because the lesson for us from this first thing is simple. Just just start talking about Jesus. Let the Word do its work because God's gospel is powerful. It's unstoppable. So that's the first scene. Let's move to the second scene where we see that Paul continues his ministry in Ephesus. We'll pick up at verse 8. We see that Paul entered the synagogue and spoke there boldly for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. 
So as is his custom, Paul now begins his ministry in the synagogue to the Jews. Now, the Jews were God's people. They knew the Scriptures really well. But we're told that Paul had to speak boldly to them, not just once, but for three whole months. Unlike the disciples of John who accepted this message straight away, we see a different response. We see in verse 9 that some of them became obstinate or stubborn. They refused to believe. They publicly maligned the way. The Jews are stubborn. Their hearts are hard. We will not accept this message. They publicly criticize this new religion. And maybe you know someone like that whose hard, heart is hard. And maybe you've, ever, you've plucked the courage to share the gospel and been rejected. And it's easy to feel pretty small. It's easy to shrink into our shelves and just be quiet. It's easy to give up out of fear of messing up the relationship, messing up the opportunity. But we don't see that in the Apostle Paul. You know, Paul wasn't a naturally gifted speaker. But there he is, arguing and persuading stubborn, hard-hearted people for three months. He teaches them about the kingdom of God, likely using the Old Testament to show that the king has come. You know, there are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament alone that point forward to Jesus. And it's likely Paul spent those three months trying to prove from the Old Testament, Jesus is the answer to those prophecies. Believe in him. You know, what we see in Paul is someone who takes great pains to teach Jesus clearly and thoroughly and convincingly. It's easy to give up, isn't it, sometimes? But what we see in this scene is people who resisted the word of God because their hearts are hard. But Paul continues to trust in God's powerful gospel. He exhausts every opportunity to speak from the word, knowing some will reject, some will reject you, but still taking heart that a seed has been planted. I remember when I led a group of boys uh, in year five in kids' church, and if you've ever led boys or taught in schools, you know a bit about what that's like, but it was hard work, man. Um, I had one boy who would tear a page out of the Bible or the booklet, put it in his mouth, eat it, and swallow it whilst I was leading. What do you do when that happens? Um, you just keep going. I don't know. But what was harder than that was just leading every week for years and years and seeing some of them just walk away from Jesus, especially those who had heard the gospel as a, as a kid. And often I wondered, is the Bible actually working? Is, is what I'm doing worth it? And God somehow gave me the patience to persevere and lead them from year five through to the end of high school. And many of them continue to faithfully follow Jesus. And some have still walked away. But I trust that God was still working, that sometimes some of them come back and they talk about something they heard years ago. The lesson from Paul's example in this second scene is persevere, thoroughly explain the gospel, give people every opportunity to hear the message, to repent. And even when they reject the message, trust that God was still at work. He sees the bigger picture. That's the second scene. Let's move on to the third scene where we see Paul actually leave the Jews in the synagogue. Now, it might sound like he's, or look like he's given up, but it's worth remembering he's given them three months, three whole months. Instead, the Lord's opened up another door for him to speak the message. And we're told in verse 9 here, he took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Paul is having daily discussions in this lecture hall. And whilst it might sound like he's downgraded from the synagogue, he hasn't failed. God has put him, some, him somewhere where the people are listening. In some versions, it talks about how he was there during the middle of the day from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., where probably the sun was at its peak and people are resting, where they could hear the gospel. And Paul is doing this every day for two years. And because Ephesus was this huge gateway city to the rest of Asia, the outcome was that every single person in the province of Asia heard the message. Isn't that incredible? Every single person. Now, it doesn't say every person believed the message, or it doesn't mean he necessarily spoke to every single person, but somehow or another, every single person, Jew or Greek, heard the good news of Jesus. Now, to give you an idea, there's a picture here of a map, and I probably could have zoomed up a little bit on it, but you can see that blue horizontal box is Ephesus, right? That's where Paul is, is at the moment, where he's speaking to in the lecture hall. And, here's, and you see the next picture... The next slide, there should be a big blue square around, I'll just go up to it myself, this whole red thing, Asia, that is the whole area 
that got reached with the gospel. Isn't that incredible? Now, there are estimates that there was roughly between 8 and 15 million people in that region around the time. That's a, a big range, right? But that's a big number. God opened a door for some of Paul's most effective proclamation of Jesus to people who were listening. You know, even when you feel like your words are just hitting a brick wall, they're just bouncing off, they're doing nothing, we can be confident that God will find a way for His message to reach people. God's gospel is unstoppable. You know, when you think about Tungabi, this area as a church you're hoping to reach, there are roughly 87,000 people in this suburb, a number that's only going to rise as more and more people come to the area. Do you believe that God in His power and wisdom will and can and will enable the good news to reach every single one of them? You know, when you drive past people enjoying their long weekends or on social media, or you see people worshipping at temples just down Old Windsor Road, do you believe that these people can be reached with the good news? I wonder what it would take for us to see these 87,000 people in this suburb alone, let alone the whole world, to be reached. It takes lots of prayer and encouragement, But imagine if every time we were rejected for sharing our our faith, we still got back on our feet. We look for creative ways to share the gospel with those around us. I love hearing what's happening in India, how they're setting up all these different clinics, the intentionality behind it. Now, not all of it may lead to conversions, but under God, we have that responsibility to do whatever it takes to see the gospel reach these people. And God has opened so many doors just to let alone in this church through kids club and youth and walk up evangelism and scripture christianity explored there are so many opportunities and so many things we could try and maybe you're involved in some of these and that's that's wonderful i want to really encourage you to keep up with that good work but maybe if you haven't yet i want to encourage you to consider your part in this this week alone there are so many opportunities um i spoke about the storytelling and prayer night on saturday uh Lockie is preaching next saturday on the topic of uh, meeting Jesus and finding peace. A really great week to bring a friend along to. Why not also chat to Mike after the service and see if there are some opportunities you could be involved in. That's what we see in the third scene. The Word reaches many people. As we think about the growing number of people around us, the lesson is take heart. God will open up doors for the message to go out. Now, as we wrap up, we'll move into the fourth scene, but we see that things really heat up. Let's see in verse 11, we see that God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Now we really see in this part that there really is a spiritual world. There are demons, but we see that God is powerful over them. The sick are cured, evil spirits are cast out, and Ephesus is slowly being transformed. People are seeing the work of God right in front of them. But we also see that some people are trying to recreate these miracles in their own way. In verse 13, we see some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. You see, these guys aren't genuine believers, but they're trying to copy Paul. They're trying to get in on this popular trend. We're told that they tried to invoke the name of Jesus, almost treating him like he's this mechanical, magic word to cast out demons. But Jesus will not let them experience his power like it's this trendy buzzword. He is interested in relationship with his people on his terms, and he will demonstrate his power on his terms. So when these sons go around trying to cast out a demon in a man, this demon can tell they don't belong to Jesus. They're not one of his people. Have a read of verse 15. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Now that sounds, that sounds a bit scary, right? But imagine what happens next. We see later that then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Imagine here for a minute, one man overpowering seven grown men, undressing to them, beating them to the point where they're bleeding and running for their lives. Now, that is scary, right, when you think about it. And we're told also that those in Ephesus were seized with fear, but we're also told that the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honour. The people are rightly afraid, but they turn to Jesus. 
It was scary what those demons could do. But at the same time, they knew that those demons were so scared of a handkerchief that had been touched by Paul, that had the power of Jesus. Imagine that these seven demons who caused grown men to run away in fear would run away if a tiny, dirty handkerchief touched them. Jesus is powerful. He could even use a light brush of a handkerchief to send demons running. And everyone could see that Jesus is the one who has real power. They recognize that Jesus is the one who is really in control. Jesus is the one who can be trusted. If you're from a culture that has a fear of evil spirits, what they can do to you, maybe you've grown up with this from your family, take heart. Jesus is the greater one. They listen to him and you're safe with him. Jesus has the power. And as people recognize that Jesus has the power over what they fear, this changes everything. In verse 18, we see, many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. See, they realize that if Jesus has power over every demon and sickness, they don't need scrolls or sorcery. They recognize that Jesus is worth giving up what was once precious to them. They didn't just hold on to it so they could use it just in case or to sell it for some money so someone else could use it, but instead they burn it once and for all because these things are useless. And they later calculate that the total amount that was burned was 50,000 a drachma is enough money to live for 50,000 days or two whole lifetimes. That's a lot of money. But when people see Jesus and treasure him above all else, everything else, as Paul says, is garbage, dung, trash. But the power behind all of this, even though we might think, wow, demons, awesome story, the power behind this is still the Word of God. That's the lesson we see throughout every one of these stories. In verse 20, we see, in this way, the Word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. God's Word powerfully changes lives. Just as it enabled them to bring what was secret and in darkness out into the light, so too God's Word enables us to bring our secret sins and bring it out into the light. Maybe you struggle with something like anger or gossip or greed or porn, but maybe you've settled for just tolerating it in small doses instead of renouncing it. Now, we all know that fighting sin is not just as simple as just stop sinning and pray more. But I wonder if we've lost the discipline of confessing our sins to one another, bringing it out towards other brothers and sisters, dealing more effectively with the root causes that cause us to go back into the same patterns again and again. I want to encourage you to think about how you will go with moving from tolerating sin to having nothing to do with it. What big steps do you need to take? And at the same time, I, I know that there are still some of us here who probably still haven't yet taken the hand of Jesus. Maybe you are still walking in some of these ways, but they don't work. It might not be magic, but maybe it's money, career, sex, all kinds of other treasures. Maybe you know that giving, up your, uh, giving your life to Jesus means giving up on some of these ways, and you're not quite ready to. And I want to say that, friends, if Jesus is who he says he is, if the, Jesus is who we've seen he is right here, powerful over demons, sickness, then you're fighting a losing battle, aren't you? If you put your trust in him, you will never need porn, success or money to medicate your deepest needs. He will meet your deepest need and your greatest need, which is to be forgiven of your sins. Just like the many people in Ephesus who heard the word of the Lord for the first time, found new life. Will you today hear the voice of the Lord calling you to place your trust in Jesus? Today, will you place your trust in him? Because God's gospel is unstoppable. He can and will do more than we ask or imagine. So let's pray to that end now. Heavenly Father, I pray right now just for those who aren't yet walking with Jesus, that your spirit would change their hearts and help them to entrust themselves fully to Jesus. And we pray, Father, would you please help us to trust in the power of your word in our own lives and those around us. When we see those around us worshipping other gods or rejecting your message, Help us to take heart in the power of your gospel, your unstoppable gospel. We pray that many in this area would hear the good news of Jesus this week for the very first time and give their lives to him. And we pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.